Hello, everybody, and welcome to our now more regular Tuesday stream. Hello. Uh, Happy New Year's. Uh, Evelyn is back, uh, finally, uh, from the store. She, she got the smokes. Um, she, has, she has returned. We're back. Well, Evelyn's back, at least. Yep. I'm back. Evelyn's back. Hooray. Uh, she's been a bit the ill. So, uh, as and a lot of people ask about that, and I said it last time, we'll maybe go into it at some point in more detail, but Evelyn is in several ways quite chronically ill. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's, I have underlying problems, and then there's been like a really, really nasty sort of like viral thing going around, so that's kind of put me down for the last couple of weeks, to be honest. Not been nice. Yes, um, but we have been loading more from the Substack. Uh, I've been doing more readings. I did a stream last week with Spoon. Uh, thanks to him for coming on last minute, because I know basically I gave him no time to prep, um, <laughs> which is, isn't the friendliest things for our stream. So uh, it's, it's been good. There's been a lot of people uh, collaborating, coming to the stream, having uh, nice comments to say. It's just been a rather... It's been a nice period of growth. So welcome to all the new people. Hello to all our regulars. Hello to all of our members. I see you in the chat there, Mr. Anthony Keane. I also saw um, English Upstart there as well, who are both our members. Again, if you do want to support us, uh, we are still fully monetized on YouTube somehow. Um, yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we can do the super chat, super stickers, all of that. Um, cool five, yes. the Substack membership. Yes, the, the best way to support us in terms of independent from YouTube stuff is via the Ko-Fi, which I'll put in the chat, which you can also use to ask us questions. All the questions will be read by both Super Chat and Ko-Fi and also on the Anti-Politics Substack, uh, on which this the piece we'll be going over was published, but it won't just be that piece. We'll be adding quite a lot to it as well. Because we quite yes. like doing this kind of one-two punch of having an article that people can reference so we don't have to repeat ourselves too much, but also doing it as a stream. So if you guys want our written content, that's what our written content is. And if you guys want to donate to us, that's the uh, the non-YouTube tax way, even uh, though we are still monetized somehow. <laughs> for anyone interested, the weather's quite crap. Yes. Uh, it's not like risk to life storm nonsense that they said it was going to be. It's just a bit of a blustery re- late January, really. Well, um, yes, it is. It is a, it is a rather blustery late January. It, we have had some heavy gusts, but luckily we're missing most of the storms. But for those who tune in for the weather report, which I know is a couple of you, yeah, it's it has been raining sideways. It has been a bit grim, but it hasn't taken anyone's roof off yet. We haven't no. quite seen any uh, any flying cows. It's raining sideways, yes, sir. Uh, but I suppose I should somewhat explain myself because this stream is some is centered around an article I wrote uh, about a week and a bit ago now. Yes. As a matter of fact, I managed to rather I have to admit, impressing myself, write it in about what like three days or something you, like you that. You did, yes. It was quite a long article, uh, but it, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that kind of proved you right came in just after it. Well, and that, of course, what else would happen? <laughs> but it's sort of. Yes, it it does sort of... uh... It's a summation of a lot of what we've been talking about in regards to containment, the adoption of our ideas by more mainstream conservatism, and trying to really map out that strategy into something that might actually benefit the regime. And in doing so, as I did in the article, I think I've hopefully brought some more people round to where our position has always been, which is that... You know, if you want to go, if you want to go right back to the the deep lore, you know, we used to sit on Rose's stream and talk about how oh, there was this this coming full right sort of movement, and it would appeal to us, but it would never really touch base with anything we really deeply felt had to be enacted upon, and no matter what it would say, ultimately because of the way it's backed and the function it has within the regime, it can't do what we want it to do. It no. never will. And so we always need to be cautious about the fact that these people are charlatans, chasters, tricksters, hucksters, whatever you want to call them. But their intentions are not pure, and fundamentally, a large portion of the centre-right believes its core legitimacy comes from the fact that it places the fascists outside. Yes, uh, the the major function of the centre-right in Britain and America and the wider Western world is 
ostensibly an anti-fascist one. Mm. That's why we put out some of the stuff talking about how Nigel Farage congratulated himself for destroying the BMP yes. and things like that. It is very, very consistent in that it patrols the outer edge of the imaginary Overton window because as we will keep insisting the Overton window is not real no <laughs> the over is the Overton window in the room with you right now <laughs> Ooh. Uh. but as you said this is this is based on your 2024 20, survival guide even though we'll be going into not just British stuff we'll be doing some American stuff too because there's quite a lot of juicy things happened on that front yes. a, a large part of the paradigm we're talking about though comes from the fact that god look at where reform was for a second there but it, it's mm. pretty much on rails that the next uk government will be keir starmer yes i suppose i could i could read the little snippet from the article here actually it has become an eminently obvious fact that the conservative party in the uk is set to lose the next election whenever that may come this year 13 years of rule has seen them do nothing but attack British national identity by immigration, by corrupted cultural messaging and setting the stage for British identity to be no more than a legal category. Be under no illusion, what it means to be British is and will con continue to remain under attack no matter who is in charge. Yes, and that is the main point in the... A lot of people understand this in Britain, I think. There are a lot of people who do understand the two parties, there's no difference between them. We've had 13 years of Tory, 13 years of Tory misrule and all that. But as we'll get to later, I don't want to spoil anything, but a lot of people don't understand that for the American paradigm. Yes. And in fact, I'd say that this paradigm in terms of not uh, people not falling into the traps of it, it's a bit easier in the UK because really... Keir Starmer is being anointed. There's so many stories, really, about the fact that we shouldn't talk about an inevitable victory yes. for Keir Starmer. I won't get them up here because we've, we've covered them before, but all the coverage you will find in the UK press is genu generally pretending that there will be some kind of contest. And some of it is trying to desperately haggle with people, saying, no, no, do believe in the system, do go out and vote, your vote does matter. Because if it is an anointing, really from more than a year out, we see kind of the... The Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss thing happens here. And, and uh, from that point on, for more than a year, we have had what amounts to a caretaker well, government. Yes. And I, the point in this, or the, shall I say, the wider point that is related in the article and will be considered as the, the way that we're looking at this as well is that, you know, Labour Party and Conservative Party are not just factions that exist for electoral success. Electoral success is how they decide whose turn it is yes. at the end of the day. And uh, that these, yeah. these factions of elites exist above and beyond election cycles, that they have long-term plans and that their plans involve, on some level, how do we make our faction of elites seem serviceable to the client groups and the populace that matter whilst we aren't in government so that at some point we have the opportunity to run as government again. And Starmer, as we've covered, is a perfect example of this. People like Tony Blair and all these sort of big wig, new Labour folk all disappeared into the shadows for yes. the best part of nearly a decade, but some of them. Most most of them, yes. And they built think tanks, they put together media networks, they they spent years, you know, working a strategy for how they were gonna discipline the radicals in their own party. And in the space of basically, you know, the last eighteen months, they've kicked it all into gear. They've put out the new Britain reports and all this new, you know, future for Britain stuff and technology and AI. We'll be doing all this stuff. New and we'll be, Britain mentioned. We'll be the governing new party, and we'll do the, what the Conservative Party promised, you know, they would, but they can't deliver. And ultimately, <laughs> at the end of the day, Starmer knows he's a white man running against a packy, so he's gonna win. Oh, that's the best. That uh, that is something that we've talked about before. But the, the the deliberate racial inversion of the parties. Yes, you have a brown party with a white leader and a white a white party with a brown leader is very 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 deliberate. They know that that moves the needle. They know that racial solidarity exists in Britain. This is why you can't just go and educate the elites in no. quotes. They already know things like Schmidt. They all read it. They all read it at university, this sort of politics. Yes. They know what we know. They are just evil and invert it to keep themselves within the elite class and keep them and keep people like us, really, and people like you from outside of it. Yep. That's how it works. They understand reality. That's how they're able to utilise it. So this begs the question. Yes. 
for you know let's say let's say labor are prospectively looking at at least a full term you know a full five years four and a half five years whatever what does the conservative party and the the people who make up it as a as a, a lasting elite faction in Britain, not just the electoral side, but the think tanks and the money men, the ideas people and the media people, what do they do to make sure that who they are stays relevant in so, at least some sense? How do they how do they return and rebuild as some sort of new thing? And I fundamentally believe that we will play a large part in this process, whether we like it or not. No, I would say that there is happening really uh, within touching distance of our political sphere, a bizarre maneuver. And we'll, we'll talk at another quote from the uh, your article in a second. But what we found is that really because Labour's been cycled in, they have these much bigger plans. They are not focused at all, really, <laughs> even on the Tory party. No, they, they have they have completely unfocused from party politics, they are already on a governance footing. Yes. And therefore, all of the rightward parties, in quotes, in, in the election, especially the Tory party, are able to look more in-house. They're already doing the recriminations. They're already on a post-election rebuilding footing. Mm. And what we will find, and what we will find going forward as we, as we talk about some of the efforts that we've I don't want to say foil, but we've documented within this sphere, is the fact that when you look at what are supposed to be right-wing organisations that are independent from the current government, it is just Tories all the way down. And this has been yes. a, a lasting theme within our work. <laughs> it's been a lasting narrative that we just keep finding effectively these nests of, of, of Tory party activists and operatives that are supposedly in places and saying things that would be unacceptable to the Tory party proper. But anyway, that is where we find ourselves. As, as you've already done the, the first one there. Yes. There's a little, a little insert here, sorry. It says that yet you believe that the primary role of those in the conservative ruling elite is to survive their coming time in the wilderness. And the problem is that as we are people effectively in the political wilderness, yeah. when the Tory party comes and joins us, in the political wilderness. It's going to get very strange. It's going to get very strange, but also very dangerous, because this is what the Conservatives did under Cameron, but in almost a leftward direction. Mm. They reached out to the members of New Labour who were in the wilderness when they were looking to take power and Labour was about to be cycled out. There was a lot of managerial confluence there. There was a lot of picking up from kind of the centre and, and and the left of the aisle. But what it looks like they're doing now to head off the uh, the much vaunted rightward movement and quote-unquote wave of populism that is sweeping over Europe, there's talk of the AFD, there's a lot of wider stuff going on. You've got Maloney, who I will always describe as a neoliberal with a swastika sharpied on her forehead for style points. That's all she is. They they basically said, vote for this person. They're a fascist. Wink, wink, nudge, yes. nudge. <laughs> it's very funny to watch them clothe their neoliberal politicians as fascists, but this is how far we've gone. But this really is the primary role. The primary role of the Tory party is to justify its existence to the rest of the uh, elite. We could, we could maybe scroll down, because I think I do expand on this uh, sort of role slightly further. Uh, whereabouts on is the next it, paragraph. Yes. Yeah, I just I think that I'll just read this paragraph here because I think this fully summarizes what we are talking about. The Conservative Party has failed this nation, not for the first time, nor will it be the last. But we shall limit our analysis to this election. Not if, but when the Tories are cycled out, they will not just give up, admit defeat, and attempt to govern no longer. We cannot become confused by thinking that political parties in the UK exist solely for the electoral process. They are organisations that exist over and above that process that seek to garner power in whatever way they can. Both the Tories and Labour in part represent factions of the ruling elite who care less about elections and more about the legitimacy of the ruling class as a whole. The election process is, in many ways, just a method of clocking in and out for these people. They are beyond election cycles. They strive for permanence in their positions with the hopes that their influence can be felt across the UK. 
And it's, it's, it's a very simple point, but it's something that is a very long thread in almost all of our work that the elite strata of British society has planning horizons over and above the election cycles. Mm. And it's one of, uh, because they exist above the election yes. cycles. That's why. And that is a point that cannot be made in any mainstream political analysis. You can't actually say that if you are, quote-unquote, on plantation with any electoral party. You can't go out and say that electoral politics is meaningless because the real decisions are made by people you cannot vote away. Mm. But that is reality, and it's, it's the shape of reality you see with your own eyes. But it's not something that people tend to extrapolate outwards. They think in these electoral cycle terms, they think that once Labour comes to power, there will be actual change when yes. really what will happen is that they will formalize a lot of change that's already happened it's not about the tories really being lefties or Keir Starmer really being a tory it, it belies the the fact that the the global and the british elite are all effectively non-ideological yes. they are not people who believe in a left-right dynamic they believe that is low well i think we can maybe describe the you know the difference between the conservative party being in power now and the labor party being in power in 12 months time will be that you know oh because keir starmer and his set of elites are slightly more friendly with some of the labor unions there will be less of the strikes that there are on now and that is not a consequence of voting. That's not a consequence, as you say, of ideology. It is the fact that the Labour Party represents the unions. The Tory Party represents some of the other elements of big business, which means one's ability to bargain with unions isn't as strong as the other. No, it isn't either. It's, oh God. The point you make here, though, and I don't even want to move on to the next section yet, is the fact that really what we're facing are... Three strategies. Yes. There's three broad strategies that we've seen from the quote-unquote centre-right to neutralise any momentum that a British dissident movement would have of any stripe, mm. but especially of a right-wing stripe. And the first of these stratagems you talk about, uh, as we'll get to here... Is adoption. Is adoption, yes. <laughs> we'll, we've got nine, good old good old Nige... Uh, uh, where, where's he? Where's he gone? There. We'll we'll get we'll we'll let Nige do our affirmations for us because it's the only way we stay on air. Let's uh, take it take it away, Nige. You may think it's complicated, but be clear: a sovereign state of Israel has been attacked. War has broken out. For decency, we must stand one hundred percent with Israel. There we go. <laughs> Israel Uber Alice. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, shall I read the, the first paragraph from this section? Just so oh yes, feel free. Context. A key aspect of rebuilding any political organisation back into ruling shape is to invigorate it with new ideas, new people and the energy they bring. It has already been noted by the likes of Academic Agent that the distant right, as we've taken to calling ourselves, performs little else than colour commentary. So many of our ideas have been mainstreamed that we have very little intellectual no novelty left to offer. There is of course not a drought but rather in our current state of organisation and with a growing popularity around what we do, we find that many who should otherwise be at the cutting edge of ideas and strategy are left to rehash simple lessons to fresh meat. Yeah, um, as some people have said, there's also the fact that Nigel, I believe, is currently in America uh, trying to do the whole Trump thing again. Yeah, no, of course he is. He might, he might just actually disappear off and become a media pundit again. It's a possibility, but there is there is an aspect here that Nigel Farage has been posited as the great right hope yes. in many ways. He has once again been posited as somebody who could either run a party that routes the, uh, the Tory party or take over the Tory party itself, which I think was possibly one of the most delusional episodes in, in, the, in the run up to this uh, this emerging they paradigm. Do, they we do go. seem to have dropped that idea a little bit, but we'll see if that comes back into the public forum. It, it, it may or may not do. There's been a lot of preparation there, but Nigel Farage is a great example of a politician who is of the regime, really. He is somebody who is a careerist. He's somebody who's made a career out of collecting energy and dissipating it. And part of the strategy is to use people like Nigel Farage and as described by Matt Goodwin, I know you go into some of the uh, 
right response stuff here too and i don't want to we want to quote any of that if, if you guys want to have a look at that do look at our trilogy of basically the tory party stuff yes of the the people who are pretending to be right wing who are a lot of these chatham house kind of insiders these policy exchange people these tufton street mob and the wider tory octopus we've talked about uh, before i think if we could maybe just use some of the bits I've quoted in here from the report. So we could start, there's, there's a, an introduction section uh, written by Daniel Sachs, CEO of Preventus, which is a little bit of one of those kind of palantir, uh, anti-terrorist software things that then becomes its own social engineering foundation. But Matt Goodwin, uh, as part of a group of people working with Chatham House wrote a paper for Sachs that he wished to have done in sort of 2010, 2011. Well, that, because that's of the rise of the Sweden Democrats. Yes, the Swedish Democrats, because of the Swedish immigration crisis, were one of the first parties to emerge that were, at least at first, um, nominally non regime right. Mm. They were non captioned, which alarmed many people, including this Daniel Sachs. And that's really why this original report was authored. And here's, here's part of the introduction by him. but... This project was born out of frustration and fear. The same forces that constitute part of the fertile soil for populist extremism. While observing developments in Sweden, a country that has been long considered immune to this trend, I became fearful of decreasing public tolerance of difference in society and the way in which an exclusionary form of politics was attracting increasing support and influence. I mean, that as a technocrat speaking right from his heart you know our our system of governance cannot deal with common people's frustrations and fears that they have within our society and those who speak ardently about wanting to solve these things are garnering support in a way that we can because if we speak like this fundamentally conflicts with our vision and we can't be seen to be that contradictory Yes, there's an element here that he's talking about. He talks about the exclusionary form of politics, which means self-segregation. Mm -hmm. It means the politics of proper national identity. It means the policy of community. It means having actual national rather than supranational politics. And that is not something that the, I, I guess, the liberal order, in quotes, can deal with. The managerial class can't deal with people who genuinely appeal to the baser urges of the majority of native peoples in a European country. That is really the crux of what this whole right, you know, right response thing was about, was about the fact that nativist movements has emerged. We can't deal with nativist movements directly because they are able to tap into a form of politics that is verboten with us. How do we work around them and how do we wrap them up and how do we, as you go into here, Pretend that we are them in certain ways. Yes. That's what the strategy of adoption here at the top talks is. is, is that's what adoption is about. Yes, it, I mean, it we, is exactly what it sounds. Sounds what it's like. About. We could uh, we could scroll down a little bit more to not necessarily the next bit that's quoted, but possibly after that. So here, uh, keep going. There we go. Uh, I think yes, this one will do. Uh, the examples used in the report themselves are referring to PEPs, or populist extremist parties. Not to be confused with politically uh, exposed persons, because no. apparently PEP is quite a popular acronym, but yeah, as you said, in this sense it is populist extremist parties, which just means non-neoliberal parties. To capitalise on these issues, uh, this is previously mentioned in, you know, demographic replacement, the problem of Islam not being compatible with the West, collapse because the workforce is losing its skills, all these things combining. PEPs need to increase the perceived importance of these issues in the minds of voters. If we follow this logic, then a second response is for the mainstream parties to attempt to decrease the importance of these issues in the minds of voters. This strategy would entail avoiding or downplaying these issues and instead shifting public attention onto issues which the mainstream party has an advantage. One example would be developing a consensual approach to divisive issues on which PEPs mobilise support, such as integration policy and working across partisan lines to avoid the politicisation of these issues. And we can, we can already see this to some extent. I mean, the perfect example would be Starmer and Blair and what they're basically aiming towards as some sort of digital ID infrastructure for immigration. 
Yes. You know, they are going to turn round to the likes of a Farage or even someone more radical and say, well, you may have a plan to shut down immigration, but how are you going to make it work? You don't have the big data. You don't have the logistics. We, we, the regime who is already in power, we do. Yes. And we will offer it to you as the solution. Uh, mentioning integration here is interesting because it's one thing we've seen a very large push into, which is that the conversation is adopted by by the Conservative Party, by the centre-right, very forcefully with all, all the stop the boat stuff and all of that that we've talked about before, but it is then channeled purely into the issue of integration and not immigration. The conversation is about what we do with people once they're here. It's not about stopping them coming over. Or apart, sending them back. Or sending them back, yes. That's the, <laughs> the big verboten is deportation. The small concession to immigration is stop the boats, which is a vector that is... Uh, 20 times smaller than quote-unquote regular immigration. Mm. Uh, it's a meaningless vector, but that is, that is what we're talking about here with adoption, in that they will assume the talking points of the populist right or the far right, in quotes, and then they will simply reframe them in a way that they think they can deal with. And really that's what we're going to see increasingly moving forward, both from the Tory party directly to us, to people like us, uh, who are non-regime right, and also from the Labour Party to the centre-right, in quotes. Yes. It basically, a, a hand is going to reach all the way down from those in power, from Keir Starmer to the Tory party, from the Tory party to us, and they're going to say, look, if you let us do digital ID, if you let us do a digital border, if you let us do a digital currency, we will promise you that this will control immigration because mm. immigrants can't have an ID and they can't spend money unless they have a basically a foolproof digital token, blah, blah, blah. It'll be sold to us in all kinds of technical terms. But that is the trap I believe that a huge amount of people will end up falling into. And we will see it pushed very forcefully from the right, from the likes of the think tanks and from the likes of people like the New Culture Forum. Or just Matt Goodwin himself. Yeah, Matt Goodwin, Unheard, GB News. Oh, look, look as All well. of these people will jump on board this bandwagon. One thing I have noticed, especially in the last few weeks, uh, that a lot of these sort of centre-right types have all jumped on the yes. Great Replacement bandwagon or the Demographic Replacement bandwagon. But the demographics they're always talking about are age. Yes. And they want to get into the Japan thing about how we don't have enough young people. And really, even though on the face of it, what it looks like they're talking about is reinvigorating the white population. It's complicated, but be clear. He's policies. going again. No, Nigel, no. Sorry. <laughs> In a certain sense, really what they're talking about is back to basics. Inflationism, capitalism, people having to work an extra five, six hours a week so they can afford to have a third child. All this kind of stuff. Which really, at the end of the day, isn't traditionalism, and no. it's not something that's going to save us. Because as we all know, the numbers at the end of the day are not the thing that matter. No, they're not. It is the ability of white people to organise across purely ethnic lines. That's what matters, and that's what they want to stop. Um, not, not even just the greater kind of concept of Europeans. It, it specifically... Rooted nationalities. Yes. It is, they are scared of, of native populations in general sense, but they are specifically scared of native populations, European native populations, in their native countries. Yes. And they will always take these... I mean, if you want to scroll down a little bit in this article here, I'm going to get to the bit where I'm talking about Brexit. We can see... Yeah, just that, that paragraph. Scroll up. Yes, that's the one. Yes. But we, we can see and use this as an example of how they can take something that's such a big, energy full issue and completely reroute it. Uh, I believe Goodwin makes a point about you know, some of these issues not being totally co-optable or you know we can only adopt them so far, we, we can't go too far because people will begin to notice. But I don't think they will. I, I go on to say here that the populist extremist party that used to exist as UKIP ran a major campaign on the issue of Brexit. And this purported to be a separation from the EU, its bureaucracy and its version of globalism towards British interests. When the regime adopted Brexit, it saw fit to reframe this separation not as independence from global structures, but further dependence on them. 
it saw fit to replace the moderate influx of European migrants with a fire hosing of migrants from the most diverse corners of the earth. Here we can clearly see how the core issue of a PEP, and a highly mobilising one at that, can be completely absorbed by the regime, its talking points neutered, and its direction completely change. We still see the after effects of this as anti-woke types champion Brexit is the cause of Britain's rapid Covid vaccine rollout. It's, it is very odd to see that narrative still in play, that you'll see people who are these legacy Brexit types who will come out very vociferously, as we'll get to in support of Israel, but also uh, in terms of like national pride for the vaccine. National pride for the vaccine, pot banging. Um, I don't know, shall I, shall I get Nigel? I could get Nigel back out to bang some pots, but we've done that a few times. Let's, let's, let's not get Nigel back out. But the pot banging, all of this stuff, the COVID pride was very, very rampant within a lot of the more regime-minded Brexit types. The mainstream centre-right were all behind it. They were all very proud of effectively what was our, quote-unquote, oper remember Operation Warp Speed? Mm. Very similar thing. Very similar thing that the, the Brexit right, who were uh, previously displayed as these political untouchables, the gammons, and the MAGA right, the deplorables, were both brought in very heavily into venerating the efforts to create the COVID-19 vaccine. But that's just one example of how previous insurgent movements are very easily folded back within the regime itself. Oof. Anyway, um, the next strategy they talk about here is engagement. It is the crowding out of the narrative with your narrative. Yes. It is the attempt to have a conversation, in quotes, from the centre-right to the far-right, but really it is just them talking at us. We saw a great example of crowd crowding out, as as we'll probably get to in a little bit. I was going to say, I, I might just stick with it, reading the first paragraph in full, because I think this one summarises so much of what we've done research-wise over the last while. Okay, fair enough. Strategies for reinvigorating your ruling class don't just stop at the adoption of new ideas. By seeming bigger than you are, one can pull the wool over many eyes and create the illusion that a politically tactical move thought out by no more than a dozen people is rather a genuine cultural movement emerging from all corners of society. Those with eyes for seeing will have already noticed this happening. Networks pop up every other week with the intention of manufacturing hundreds of young talking heads with a variety of centre-right to right-wing beliefs. Almost daily, viewers of GB News, Talk TV, Piers Morgan, Talk Radio etc. are bombarded with fresh anti-woke faces desperate for their 15 minutes of fame and a chance to red-pill a few normies. To the passive viewer, this looks like an organic movement as if hundreds of freshly suited youths have all at once taken a stand against the woke tyrants. Polling provided by GB News, Goodwin, or those at Unheard helps to solidify this illusion further. It is, however, all lies. The youths in question are plucked out of university, attached to a talent agency or larger NGO like Young Voices, and given connections and bookings across the media landscape. This will be more familiar to those who watched countless lefty talking heads spawn like an infestation on our screens as woke came into ascendancy. I would implore researchers, read, uh, readers to research and remind themselves just how false the woke cultural movement was, for the anti-woke movement will be all the same. It's the same mechanism, and I'm glad you mentioned that, and that you end up with these leftist activists all popping out of what feels like nowhere. Um, to to be on your screens. And really, a lot of them are completely replaceable. They have no real identity. A lot of them are just effectively the worst and most rank pundit talking heads who have very, very little to say. And I, I again, I, I don't know to say that about Rose of Dawn because she was brought on basically as an outsider, but it's the same way that certain people from YouTube are lifted up. Yes. And basically told if they'll say the right things and play ball, that they'll get more appearances. But... Quite honestly, to her well, credit, she didn't see much point in doing that. I think we are, <laughs> especially with the stuff that we have done, we are probably of the opinion that Rose of Dawn was brought onto Good Morning Britain at a period where these people were more ignorant and really didn't know what they were dealing with. I think they've become a lot more careful. 
that still means the the Tory shaped hole and everything that's going on in the right wing in Britain is very much evident, and we've constantly been able to point it out. But the fact that it's not screamingly obvious is. I think a consequence of them being a little more subtle with it over the last couple of years. Well, the the big giveaway really is it's like the Douglas Murray effect. Mm. Douglas Murray is somebody who did you know was the strange death of Europe and all that. He's somebody who tried to position himself as the, quote unquote the most based acceptable voice. Yes, I'm a new Roger Scruton. I'm even more cutting edge. Yes, and all he does is end up being activated effectively as a Mossad agent after his time, again, if you watch our previous stuff, at Just Journalism and his time as, in 2011, as the right response documents being written, basically, he is doing lobbying on behalf of the Israeli state. Yep. Um, it's... And this, this has sprawled out into it now being its own media movement. Yeah. And we can talk even more about crowding out here. I'll, I'll, I can read this and if you want. Yeah. An even more intense version of this crowding out strategy was carried out in the weeks after the October 7th attack by Hamas. Instead of Islam being discussed um, as its own issue or the security of Britons being considered sans the framing uh, gymnastics of media elites, one found constant discussion of the threat of Hamas and Hamas sympathizers pose to the Jewish population of Britain. Furthermore, at a time when the uh, critical energy surrounding multiculturalism was at a recent high, people were as critical as they have been recently, the conversation was switched into how a multicultural Britain has failed its Jewish population. It was only with the help of this astroturfed anti-woke network that such narrative dominance was possible even within explicitly right-wing spaces. The likes of Douglas Murray, GB News reporters... Uh, like Charlie Peters or Turning Point UK puppet Darren Grimes being sent off to Tel Aviv to help cement this as a real issue for the right. Nothing will make the average man turn a blind eye to obnoxious and corrupt anti-Semitism campaigns. Um, like a torrent of war footage, detailed stories of the horrors of Hamas attacks, and live footage of uh, plucky British reporters sheltering amidst shelling uh, i don't think we can be much clearer than that what has happened is and what we talked about when we talked when we did our stream called anti-woke in a post-woke world we were if anything not cynical enough no. we were not cynical enough about where this was going what's happened is that effectively the the woke paradigm has been superseded the woke has been put away and anti-woke in a post-woke world is just israel yeah. it's just the israeli lobby it is just the domestic zionist lobbies and it's just the ethno-religious interests that they represent that is that is how the, the, you know, and why that network was created. There is a very large, strident network saying lots of things that everybody in Britain agrees with about silliness, about clown world, about all these woke topics. And overnight, all of them are activated to become these extreme mouthpieces for the Israeli state, to a point that... It effectively went too far. They had to shut Ben Shapiro up for a little bit. Well, yeah, no, it, you it had was like, it was possibly the yeah, like most trig trigonometry yeah. man, constant kissing around, going, "This is this is a dark day for Britain. My my Jewish brothers do not feel safe on these streets." <laughs> As if this was, you know, the ending of British civilization as we knew it. Because the very same people brought, you know, 20 years ago, all these foreigners here and they don't like Jews. <laughs> and they decided that despite the fact they've lived in Britain for two decades, they still don't like Jews. And that's just not going to... We're that's... not going to change that without getting rid of them. But of course, the conversation is not getting rid of them. Well, the conversation is, how do we make these people cohesive into our society? There was a moment where the conversation was about getting rid of them, from Douglas Murray, but it was specifically getting rid of, as uh, Germany talked about and as France talked about, people who deny the right of, ex to, of existence to Israel. Yeah. It was specifically framed in pro-Israeli terms. And what we always talk about is why can't a British nativist movement 
be about a British nativist framing? Why must it be a framing of some other nation? And we have never had an answer well, from think, any of these quarters I because it's we, not a question they can answer. I think we do have an answer. It starts with adoption. It continues with engagement and crowding out. And the plan finalises and comes into its own as one is contained, segregated and delegitimized. Yes. Um, we'll move on to the, the third aspect here. We've been through adoption. We've been through engagement and crowding out. It's now time we go through the practical implications of containment. Look at, uh, as I start here, issues like the Great Replacement are already in the process of being rhetorically contained. It has become less and less a discussion of specific ethno-cultural replacement at the hands of a certain elite class. Now it's discussed as a red versus blue issue pertaining to voting demographics. It's lowered to the standard of petty politicking, cheating, or an issue of economics as opposed to what it really is, an attempt to erase majority white nations entirely. Yes. This is really the crux of the matter. I am certain that many centre-right politicians are gleeful about the reduction of whites down to another minority group. This makes the attempt to run an explicitly populist and implicitly pro-white ethnic movement much harder, as the majority isn't visibly recognised as the British people. Rather, they become the melting pot of peoples who believe in British values. How awfully American. By reducing the native population of Britain into a minority, we become just another client group, the beck and call of the politicians who give us a voice. What you're describing <laughs> here, uh, rather prophetically, um, is white civil rights. Yes. You are describing the paradigm that is coming of white civil rights. And really, uh, in the days after this, we both, well, both you and AA, really, because you both kind of, he just squeaked in. Yeah. He just squeaked, like, hours afterwards, uh, Rufo makes the tweets. But before before we get into this and before we go any further, I'd like to read some of our super chats. Well, we do have a couple. Though. We do have a few, yes. Uh, thank you, Connie, current year for the two pounds. It says, great conversation we had in Delling Pod. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Yes. I've had quite a few questions about some of the things we talked about, which is good. Um, if you can reach out to us on Telegram or Discord or even just in a YouTube comment, do. I do try and keep an eye on as much of that as is humanly possible. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> the, the one that gets me sometimes is that we get questions about stuff. And then I, I mean, this is no, uh, no, mm, why does nobody talk to me? But I, I almost never get a DM on Twitter from people. I will actually answer those if you send one. So if you do actually want to direct a question to us, it's not the worst way because it's actually quite a quiet channel of communication. Yes. Um, $5 here from Mint20. Thank you, Mint20. Uh, it's very frustrating to watch people I respect appear to fall into the containment trap. 2024 is the year of containment oppression. It will... A lot of people have cottoned on somewhat by knowing that it's an election year. Mm. Um, it is an election year, and it is it is an, it is something that will basically uh, eat up all of the political energy. Um, I will quickly say as well, because I forgot at the beginning, but if you guys uh, don't want to donate but do want to help us out some way, uh, liking the video, I hate to say it, it does help. Yes, uh, you, thank you. You have to play the game a bit. So, hey, there's 220 folk watching and only 60 likes. You can't all be that lazy. <laughs> uh, we've got another super chat as well from Coney Current Year. Do you think the Tories being cycled out might give us some breathing room? Well, our our whole crux really is that it's the other way round. Yes. As they are cycled out, they don't have legitimacy from governing, so their legitimacy will probably come from us. I don't know if we want to go through some of the other ones we've got uh, here as well. Uh, we'll 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 go through some more in a sec. Uh, we don't want to. We'll we'll do the rest of the super. I, I see loads of you guys donating. Thank you guys for donating. We will make sure that all the super chats get read. We're not just doing super chats now. Don't worry, guys. We have got more stream to go. Yes. I don't want people thinking we're just going to sit here reading. I, I know a lot of people tune out for the super chats. So we'll do some more at the end. I just wanted to get through the first few that we got before uh, if those people tune now. But we now we are now moving on to the uh, God the the concept that has been. Well, I've we yeah. should, there's a couple more bits in here I think we should go over. Okay, because I, go ahead. Uh, what bits are those then? Uh, well, I, I was going to add on further that one of the things that we always see on the GB News stuff at the end of the day 
is about brown conservatism. I yes. think I might just call it this from now on. Brown conservatism. You know, all these... Uh, it's your favourite. It's Nana Akuna and all these other people. And, and they've got the stuff to say because they are British because they support British values. Wink, yes. wink, wink, nudge, wink, nudge. wink, nudge, nudge, yes. And fundamentally, those people are there and present so a conversation about ethnicity can't even be implicitly had. No. There can't even be the, the slightest assumption that when someone says English, they mean white. <laughs> they mean native-born English people exclusively. That can't be allowed. And that that's a... I feel a very big part of what they're doing here. And I go on to mention sort of further in this section some of the stuff we've picked out previously from the extreme right-wing terrorism support most recently put out by MI5, within which it has this expansive section discussing what it refers to as cultural nationalism. Uh, yes, where, where is this? There it is, sorry. Now, cultural nationalism and the definition they have for it, as we can see here, GTAC has defined cultural nationalism as a belief that Western culture is under threat from mass immigration into Europe and from a lack of integration by certain ethnic and cultural groups. The ideology tends to focus on the rejection of cultural practices such as the wearing of the burqa or the perceived rise of the use of Sharia law. Now that is such a, a wide mark. It is. It's, it's a description of basically every Daily Mail reader. Mm -hmm. It's a description of basically every Telegraph reader. It is a description of basically everybody who is quote-unquote right-wing or centre-right in the UK. And they, they specifically describe this, though, as an ideology of extreme right-wing terrorism. Mm. That this is an ideology that brings about, in quotes, extreme right-wing terrorism. Because that's what this document is describing. They're not excluding this definition. They are explicitly including yes. it in their definition of what is a terrorist belief well, system. Well, they, they say that this, this cultural nationalism is the more dangerous one because it's so popular and it's so widespread. And I go on to say, what else are we to see here but several arms of the state acting in cahoots? One half builds a new media empire tapping into sentiments they know are not represented in traditional media. Meanwhile, MI5 gives them cause to police and punish an audience that they cater to. Suggest that even the mention of a lack of integration as a possible signal to one's terroristic intent gives scope wide enough to arrest millions across the UK. But that, of course, isn't the plan. These exaggerated standards are the result of a need to write an illegal backstop in case anyone else wants to helm their own ship of cultural nationalism. Yes, it's about really creating a show me the man, show me the crime. It's mm. a, in a classic piece of what we talk about as a narco tyranny. Yes. It is technically illegal in Britain to hold beliefs that Nigel Farage holds publicly. It is effectively, in the eyes of the security services, a precursor to terrorism if you don't believe that immigrants are integrating, you know, if, they, if you believe they're integrating inadequately, like a lot of the reports from policy exchange say. But what, what it means is that the regime can say that mm. and you cannot. Yes. Uh, and you can only do that in the way that they say you can, in the spaces they say you can. And it's why the free speech union says they defend legal free speech. Yes. Because they comply entirely with what the regime tells them to do. That's what those we weasel words are about. When you see legal free speech, what, you, what, you, what they actually mean is total compliance. <laughs> anyway. uh, I think for the time being we will leave the article here and go on to some other stuff yes. but this article is up free on the substack i understand it's a bit on the lengthier side but there really isn't anything too too complex in here to understand and a lot of links to some of our other research if you have not read it please i implore you to read it or share it to others who haven't because it's something i think we cannot do without we must police our communities and we must police these actors who wish to adopt our ideas and contain our movements from them entirely. No engagement whatsoever. They should all be completely cut out and humiliated. There can be no compromise. No. Because that's what they're banking on. Yes. Um, but 
the framework that is coming, and I believe that this will be what is offered to us, is something... Well, it's white civil rights. It is the idea that finally, after being excluded from the framework, after not being a quote-unquote minority, that once British people and native people in all kinds of European countries start to become a minority or start to feel like a minority, they will be given a seat at the table. Yes. They will be given a place as a client group of the regime that is equal to all the others, completely disregarding that they are the native peoples of their land. I mean, I think in the most literal sense, we could describe this as the Americanization of European peoples. Yes. The, The status of citizenship will become the primary denoter of what you are, not the status of blood, soil, heritage, and spirit. Yes. You know, the, these things that are unique to your race and your people, these will become sort of secondary things that, you know, are, are distinctions and divisions between people that must be washed away so that the, the economic model can continue on. I'd like to give a quick shout out here to, I'm not going to read it, but AA's uh, Rufo Reich and Mecca Bentham. Yes. Uh, he, he brought this out on the 10th of January. And then, oh, sorry, five days five days later, Chris Rufo actually just goes and says what he says he's going to say. Yes. Uh, and to be fair, he also goes and says exactly what you said they were going to say in this, uh, in your article as well. I, I think quite honestly, this has been quite heavily telegraphed to yes. us because it is something that they want to know I want us to know is coming because they think a lot of people will agree with it. But what he's talking about, with the what he refers to as the Rufo Reich, will be this carve out. It will be the white carve out in a civil rights sense. And you know what? I don't think anyone can quite say it better than Mr. Rufo himself. And I put uh, Claudia Gay in the white civil rights thumbnail there because very suspiciously, Chris Rufo came out of nowhere collected a meaningless woke scamp in quotes and then Bill, immediately what was his name bill hackman yes who's some uh, multi-billion dollar zionist financier yes. type who of claudia, course is the perfect fit for the job claudia gay was replaced by a, a literal zionist <laughs> yeah <laughs> well due to chris rufo's efforts and then his response, his idea to capitalise on this momentum from doing the equivalent of pulling down a diverse poster that the that the college put up, because that woman was never in charge of Harvard, in quotes. Uh, that it was never the case. But anyway, shall we, shall we read through some of this because it's yes. just outright lies? This, this is this is this is the strategy. This is what you will be sold. Yep. The right needs to champion colorblind equality and reform existing civil rights law to make it a reality because real civil rights has never been, been tried. tried. Yes. The agenda overturn Griggs versus Duke Power Co. Rescind LBJ's executive order on affirmative action. Abolish the disparate impact provisions from the 1991 Civil Rights Act. Restructure the enforcement bureaucracy to ban DEI-style discrimination. These are all majority positions. Even in California, voters reject racial preferences. Now, that's not true. None of that's true. No. And fundamentally, it matters not anyway, because next week, when they, you know, they decide to further develop ASG or whatever the next name for it is, and they wish to put in, you know, your your climate situation yes. into your credit score, they won't need affirmative action because they'll just write another method for it and call it science. Yes. <laughs> it's a... Again, this this is the proposed white carve-out. I this, see we should yes, keep yes. going as well. We, we, are, we are keeping going. No, what, no. I'll, what I'll do is... Um, yes, is that, that bit's this, the this, one that got me. This one here is what gets me. To attack MLK is short-sighted. We measure our great statesmen by their accomplishments within the tragic conditions of history and human nature. Whether it's the founders or Dr. King, a certain degree of idealisation is necessary for creating a coherent national narrative. It's a nation of proposition. It's the proposition nation. He has a dream. He's, he's, I, I his dream was... He is going to say, calling him Dr. King as well and using him in the same sentence as the founders... 
I'm I'm surprised that there wasn't more. There was a lot of revulsion to uh, from uh, this to this from us. Even even I responded with this as a quote tweet saying the fact that if I was an American, I'd actually like come looking for you because that's what you're saying is you want rid of me. I mean, Christopher Rufo is a man who I believe has outwardly and explicitly stated his preference as the grand plan of like the Atlee oh. mixing all the races sort of thing so yes. we don't have racial animosity well, anymore. This this is the man who basically seized the anti-woke microphone mm. with the Claudia Gay campaign. Loads of people in our sphere got behind it. We didn't because we... Uh, to our you know to give ourselves some credit saw that this was a load of shit. We saw that this was going after once again the woke universities, which doesn't do anything. And everyone who amplified uh, Chris Rufo by extension amplified this message. This is the anti woke containment trap. This is the center right trap. The people will give these people will turn around, give you a taste of what you want, and then blast you with a message that will be otherwise. And then we get to the, the fundamental crux of the point. The correct reaction to the left's noxious ideology is not to say we need racialism for the right, it's to say we recognise the realities of race but aspire to a higher standard, the full expression of natural rights that subordinates racial faction to the best of our nation. There's like so many things wrong with us here. Because one, he's saying it's left-right when it's not, it's white-black or white-non-white. Yes. Then it's about it's recognizing the realities of race, but aspiring to a higher standard, which is like the weird Jordan Peterson stuff of well, you don't have to actually believe in God, you just have to apply the Christian morals, okay? You know, it's it's all these sort of rationalizations around it to then essentially admit, well, you can say race is real, you can't point out the realities, and God forbid you wish to construct a society that acts upon them i.e. every civilization everybody lived in up until about 40 years ago. Uh, uh, yes, living the dream, I know it's Twitter, I know, I know, I know, but it, it, it illustrates a, uh, this... a valuable point. We'll, we'll, we'll excuse using Twitter uh, to illustrate the points because Twitter is where a lot of the... Such a perfect dilution of it. Yes, it's also just where a lot of the outgroup rhetoric is put, I'm afraid. And Twitter is the based ball pit. The reason mm. all this is on Twitter is because Twitter is the based ball pit. It is where the right has been placed in a giant containment pen so they can be fed things like this. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, say, for example, if you're someone who likes Elon Musk, you can have your feed dominated with pictures of him at Auschwitz wearing a kipper. With Ben Shapiro. Of course. A lot of pe- I had to, to be fair, there's a meme version of this coming up at some point, but I had multiple people have to ask me if this was real or not because this does not look real. I mean, I mean, look at it. It's, what's funny here is Elon Musk is the tallest man in this picture, and I think he's only about five foot seven. <laughs> it's, it's, oh my god! But it, it's just Elon Musk visit out switch after uproar over anti-Semitic mess. X months after he endorsed an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, the CEO of X went on the site site of the Nazi death camp. Really, this is his contrition tour. This is actually he, he'll be at the Wailing Wall next. This is this is his uh, a Holocaust chosen, yes. struggle session. This, this is his Holocaust struggle session, and yes. we are all being shown it as well. Yes. I mean, I, so I put I, it in a tweet earlier on, but. For us, we have always thought that Elon Musk was like a, a nothing burger at best, and at worst, someone... I'm sad my account, my other account, got banned when he first first took over the site mm. because there's some choice stuff I said to some people about no, that, I, I, and I wish I still I had it because a lot of people well. behave like complete idiots. And quite honestly, I'm not I'm I'm not gracious about it because those people need a kicking because they need to not do it next time. But I, I I will for a moment call out AA and say he did have a fart huffing copium stage. I'm sorry, Mr Mr. Pavarotti, but you did drink the Elon Kool-Aid. You can't have any faith well, the, the, in, in these people. I will I will go in my spiel here and say that Elon Musk must have already been pre-compromised before he ever get anywhere near Twitter because he took massive amounts of government subsidy both at Tesla and at SpaceX. He was never your guy. No. And if you acted like he was your guy, well done. You wasted your time and everyone else's time. Well, isn't it even better, though, that to some extent aspects of the regime decides that even they don't want you to think that he's that he's our guy. 
just... they want to go through like five year old levels of storytelling about how he's he's so sorry about how people have had misgivings about the greatest crime in history on his own website and it's he's so grateful that they've given him a second chance they, he's the whole thing it's is storytelling it it's is great. it is storytelling <laughs> they've been real then and then They've been they've been basically talked down to. I mean, look at look at the. I'll, I'll get the whole image up later. But the, this is from Reuters. Elon Musk makes private visit to Auschwitz. <laughs> it's, it's so private. He's got a, a, a. It's it's the it's the European uh, Jewish Association. Never again is no. Uh, Never again. It, the, the thing is, by using "Never Again Is Now," they are explicitly linking this as a pro-Israel war rally. Y- yes, using "Never Again Is Now" is, uh, is now is like the IDF war cry. That is the propaganda they are using. But the, the private visit, uh, <laughs> it's just again, look at it. The the "Never Again" with their hands on it. The, the star. He's lighting a candle. He's got a He's got a small hat on that says European Jewish Association on it as he is part of their delegate. It's just, it's almost too much. This is what I mean by like five-year-old levels of storytelling. The only way this could have been more extreme is if he emerged out of a tunnel to get there. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, this is the most cartoonish you can make like Zionist contrition porn, which is what this is. This is, <laughs> hi- this is him actually doing this. Yeah. He's actually rubbing his hands together and going, Mia culpa, Mia culpa. It is ridiculous to witness this. And you, well done. If you believed in Elon Musk, congratulations. You richly humiliated yourself. Yeah, you're welcome. You, you're welcome. Well done. We, we warned you. We, 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 here's, here's, here's the meme version. I don't know how many of those you can spot in... Uh... Our beat Mike out item bounce. <laughs> it's, 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 I don't know. Look, I've got... I've, I've, I've tried, guys. There's Netanyahu as the sun. We've got the air ride there to make the items bounce. Uh, if you don't know the item bounce, uh, do look up the item bounce. Uh, He's but, crawling out of the tunnel. Ben Shapiro's down. Sorry, bounce Ben Shapiro. Um, Jordan Peterson's down here crying at this beautiful scene. Uh, he's crawling out the tunnel. There's a there's a beautiful lampshade over there and uh, some Minecraft textures for absolutely no reason. And I also put that there again because it's just kind of cartoonish. But this this is my what, this is only, my quick photo. The only thing you're missing here is all the pictures that Gavin McInnes keeps putting on his page of him <laughs> drawn as like a gnarled like you know Jew. Going, don't send me these. These next person that sends me a Gavin McJew memes getting blocked, and everyone's just like, lol. I hear the tunnel was dug to Shapiro's exact dimensions. <laughs> must, must be nice. Must must, must be nice. Um, tell you what, well, we're in a slight meme stage here. Uh, what I'll say is uh, because I don't want to go on forever, I will make this the cut off for super chats and donations. Yes. I'll double check we've not got any over on the Ko fi. Uh, but if you guys want to send me on donations, do it now because we're going to be reading the donations quickly. And then we will move on to our final topic, which is we will actually be talking about Trump for once. <laughs> I know, I know, we try to avoid it, but right, you we can read these if you want. Yeah. I- yeah, Joe sent us a tenor. Reform is basically UKIP. Surely it's better to elect them so people can see they won't live up to rhetoric during the normie. You're normie and cut into the centre right more. Yes, but watch our stream on why you can't take over the Tory party. Fundamentally, we are operating on the back foot. We do not have resources and people to spend. We cannot afford, you know, to almost use some sort of AA slick. Crusader yeah, yeah. Kings 2 analogy. We don't have enough energy points in a single turn to make it all work in one go. It will always collapse before you get to the sort of final point. We need to build our own thing wholly independent of reform, of UKIP, of Tory money, and have it be backed by us for us. The only way to guarantee that it is not co-opted is to actually do things ourselves. Now, that's a white pill, that's not a black pill. There's a lot for people to do. Um, uh, Bill, Bill Foss, Bill Forrest Knight, uh, Brexit is Brexit, stop the boats, two genders, bring back industry... Uh, I'm assuming that I'm assuming direct control uh, neo-lib slash neo-con harboring. He's uh, making that say... Uh, I believe that's a Mass Effect 2 reference. But, yeah. But yes, uh, assu- assuming direct control. But it, it is true that a lot of this messaging is just regime messaging, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Twisted Frenzy. 
In your view, do you think Sargon and the Lotus Eaters are cynical cynical enough to understand and agree with your points, or will they fall for the containment narrative that the powers of be are waving? That's a very good question. I can assure you there's some people in his office who fundamentally agree with what we have to say. However, there's other people that we are unable to have a conversation with. I'm sure if he's out there, Carl, we'd be happy to talk about this and see what your long-term plans are and whether or not you risk being contained along with some of the other sort of maybe more Tory-aligned uh, outfits out there. So as far as we're aware, it's open-ended. Uh, thank you. Uh, does thank you for the five pounds? Does a bit of rough. That's <laughs> these bit of rough. These bit of rough. Sorry, I'm, I'm, my dyslexia is kicking in. Remember, friends, no matter how dark our path. We will win, and this trial will make us stronger, and they will never have this hold on our people again. Hopefully. We, yes. we can we can, but hope, and we do hope here. Well, uh, we are not people who tell you not to hope. We just tell you not to hope in, in falsehoods. <laughs> in falsehoods, yeah. really. Yeah, it's Nathan G- C.J. Hood there. Can Thank we you, have Nathan? faith in anyone? Have faith in yourself. Uh, have faith... A complete and utter unwavering faith in yourself. Have faith in yourself. Have, have if you, you know, if you've refined them, have faith in your ideas. Have faith in your family. Have faith in your community, mm. and to a, a you know to, to an extent, have a faith in your people. Yep, and and have faith really that all of this sh- shall pass, because a lot of it is very artificial. A lot of it is not anything. It's <laughs> not anything that can last forever. So do do have faith in that. I can tell you one person to not have any faith in. <laughs> who drum? Who who would that be? Uh, really, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of surviving 2024 for the Americans is, look, please don't buy into the Trump stuff. No, don't even talk about like, it. Remember when he was elected in 2016 and he did nothing and then Biden got in and, you know, the, the war in Ukraine still happened and basically he has no legacy? I mean, there was still COVID and lockdown. Yeah, there was... Uh, remember his Operation Warp Speed? Remember him being the architect of uh, of the Vax? Remember all that? Yeah. Remember him being the person who who let the ATF redefine what a firearm is in the he wake had, of the Vegas shooting? He had to sit back and sit in his hands while everyone was tried at Charlottesville. Yeah, yeah. Remember, he allowed them to run roughshod over him with January 6th, you know. Yeah, it's... Uh, fundamentally, uh, uh, Trump cannot accomplish anything. He will not be no. your Caesar. To believe he is is insane. Oh, if, you, if you believe that Trump will materially make your life better in the long term, you are wrong. <laughs> you are definably wrong. He is, he is going, uh, he's going to be in power. No matter what people say, no matter what the cases are, I thought at first there was an outside chance of a compromised candidate, but really all signs point to Trump. Yep. He is somebody that the regime has already survived. People are always angrier now. He's Excuse better me? now. No. Here's how DeSantis Stop can it. still win, Pedro <laughs> Gonzalez told me. Uh, Pedro, yeah, DeSantis drops out, Pedro Gonzalez most affected. Um, he can still win. He can still win. He but, can still win to me, goddammit. But, but Trump is not your Caesar. No. He is somebody who is flattered by uh, all of the stuff with, like, uh, Ice Cube and all of that, if you remember. He's somebody who tries to flatter... Hood for Trump. Yeah, yeah. He tries to flatter large parts of America. He is, at the end of the day, a Republican politician. And putting your faith in a Republican politician in the year of our Lord 2024, or ever, really, is a terrible Misstep, idea. yes. Do not do it. Don't buy into the idea that he is going to bring you any change. Because he is not, <laughs> and they've already they've already agreed to this as well. You've basically got a couple of articles that confirm this. Um, well, yes, his America stares down uh, a Trump Biden repeat, um, as we've got on screen here. But there's also here uh, one from the New York Times in their little deal book section. It says, "Deal book newsletter: A consensus emerges uh, at Davos. Trump will win re-election." Yep, there you go. Uh, in private, many business and political leaders at the World Economic Forum say they, expected, uh, Donald Tr- they expect Donald Trump to return to the White House. In fact, many have already started to welcome it. Uh, here's another one. Sorry, just a quick polling. Trump tops his opponent while Biden hits a new low in approval ahead of Iowa caucus. It's, again, been quite heavily telegraphed. and There isn't really the... There isn't really the reing from all quarters we've got used to. I don't. I'm not going to play this because we've been getting hit recently, really, really badly by playing even small clips of other people's content, which is kind of annoying. Uh, you know, it's fuck. I'll, I'll, tr- I'll, 
I'll risk playing this one because it is. We just can a, always cut it off the end of the vod. Yeah, it, it is fun. just a TikTok, but uh, this is as Charlie Kirk points, points out here. Uh, Blackstone CEO Stephen A. Schwartzman tells the Davos crowd that the U.S. is not prepared for four more years of Biden. I'm it, sure that's a German name. Yes, it, it, basically he's coming out and saying, "Look, guys, Trump won't be that bad." But we've now got two trillion dollar uh, deficits uh, with no end in sight. Uh, we've got our debt to GDP uh, going up. We've got open borders with eight million people coming over. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that the country, You're gonna try and stop frankly, it is prepared for four more years of that because uh, those things all poll very negatively. So I, I can't uh, really project you know what what would happen now it doesn't have it on thank yeah. god so so there's like the elite finance class along with there's another clip as well we can get up in a sec yes you know along with jamie diamond from jp morgan i'm not going to play this one because it will get struck but basically putting forward the idea of trump's coming uh he's basically a certainty biden's been a disaster even by our measurements we can't hide the numbers anymore we should be prepared for Trump and we shouldn't mock the populace behind him because fundamentally it keeps them pacified. Yeah. They're the, you know, Trump's in, they're happy for another four years. We can continue to rape them financially. No one cares. Well, it's JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon. If you do not control the borders, you are going to destroy our country. Now that now that they are sending migrants into New York, all my super liberal friends realize what the problem. Huh? Hmm. That that is a lot. That is fundamentally a lie. I'm sorry, but the idea that the minor scale busing of migrants into New York as a performative political act has quote unquote red pilled the super liberals you, in New York is insane. Do you it's remember when uh, DeSantis was going to completely unwrite uh, progressivism in California? by shipping a bus full of migrants to Martha's Vineyard or whatever it fucking was. Ooh. Ah, uh, dear. But it, it, does, it does seem really that the American business class, at least, at least are not uh, sounding the klaxon. There's some... The normal... The Democrats have to make noises and go, no! Because but that's the, what they're expected to do. The money deletes clearly don't care, though. No. And they are happy to actually go out there and seem to be passively supporting... Trump, because he's that little of a threat to the regime. If anything, things have gone so far, and I think this is possibly the point the AA has made as well, that they actually look forward to a Trump figure because they see within him some level of stability and cultural passivity that they are kind of desperately in need for, especially yes. if they're going to be bringing in you know, another lockdown esque event in two years' time. Is I, anyone going to do it if Biden says do it? No. no. <laughs> but when Trump says, hey, oh, ma, hey, oh, yeah, oh, hey, I'm the hood for Trump, woo, and all this kind of shit, and then it's climate lockdowns, and people are like, yeah, cool, whatever. You're going to give us checks like last time, aren't you? Ah, oh, here we go. JP Morgan, CEO. Uh, again, it's just, it's so regime, and it's also him kind of preparing the way. Or a little bit of what we saw the Ricky Beshan stuff, which is uh, bussing migrants around the country to own the libs. Hmm. Um, the the whole thing of of haggle, like if if you're bussing migrants around to own the libs, I saw a comment there saying, you know, put a refugee center next to every gate community. No, that's what a lot of these activists actually want to do, and that's what hmm. they're proposing. The idea of redistribution, the idea of owning the libs with migration, is still bussing migrants into people's communities. Yeah. Do do not do that. Do not think like that. I mean, you've got uh, who's the guy that's touted amongst some of these Tory adjacent folks as is one of the based MPs, Neil O'Brien, I believe his name is. Even he put out a long form sort of substack thing with loads of statistics in it today. And fundamentally, the crux of it was, oh, well, there is immigration and it's bad, but isn't it even worse that some people are more affected by immigration than others? Yes. Sort of subtly suggesting that, you know, in the same way that net zero is okay if it equally affects us all negatively, if immigration equally affects us all negatively, then really it's not a problem. It's just changing with the times. But um, kind of in, in a quick summation here, we'll, we'll, we'll do a quick summary. 
Um, the strategies to deal with the right have been adoption. They've been crowding out and, you know, kind of engagement or false engagement. And they've been kind of containment and control. Yep. They have been an idea that, you know, you can pretend to be them. If you can't pretend to be them, you can shout over them. If you can't shout over them, you can put them in a little box. Uh, give me a second. I might actually grab a paragraph from the end of the big AC finish off of uh, feel free. I do. I do have it up on screen here. Also, uh, before we do though, I will. I will. I will do another quick shilling for the people who weren't here at first and say, if you do want to donate to us, the best way to do it in terms of not having a cut taken is via the uh, the Ko-Fi. If you want to support us via a paid membership on Substack, where this article was originally published, um, please do. All of this does help, and if you interact with the video, it does help us too. A comment or a like or just sharing it to people you think would like it. Yeah. We are still a relatively small YouTube channel, and we really don't make any ad money. So anything you do does help us quite a lot. It has quite an outsized impact. And thank you again to all of our members and all of you. Some of you have been supporting us for three years now yes and it, uh, continuously some of you so thank you we'll be doing something as a thank you to the members quite soon there's probably going to be a few members only uh piece of content so do watch out for those but yes. anyway i was going to say scroll basically to the last two paragraphs uh yeah we'll, we'll just go over the ending here the ending we call the deadly confluence because yes. this is this is our kind of conclusion here Altogether, this allows the centre-right to fulfil its most sincere belief and become a legitimate ruling elite once again in the eyes of those who matter. By following a strategy akin to Keir Starmer, they can craft and continue to manage a movement that they already have an escape plan for. What better way is there to accrue ruling legitimacy than demonstrate your ability to take advantage of and thoroughly rout the fascists? both within the conservative ruling elite and without amongst the chattering classes and established managerial busybodies, it will be agreed upon that their ruling legitimacy as a whole has been reinforced. The greatest threat, an organised, independent, vitalist right-wing force has been co-opted, bent over a barrel and dumped lifeless in, lifeless in the nearest lay-by. It is my hope that 2024 onwards holds something completely different in store for us. However, we cannot, we cannot afford to hang on to hopes or goodwill. We need to be prepared, each and every one of us, for the eventuality that the regime needs us in some way. When it does, we must reject it, offer it nothing but your scorn. We will never subvert the regime in its current form, nor can we fight openly in public debate. We can only seek refuge in the wilderness, tending to our preparations for the one day when the risk of battle is justified. <laughs> that's, that's, well, that's, that's everything really. That's everything really we have to say. If you do enjoy, like I said, if you do enjoy our content, do support us. Do look out for these streams. We'll try and do them on a Tuesday as much as we can. There'll be a piece on the Substack <clears throat> itself coming out on Monday. Um, so again, look, look out for more stuff on the Anti-Politics Substack. But uh, what I will say is thank you guys for watching. Yes. Have, have yourselves a very, very good evening and good night. Go to the pub. <laughs>